God, right. Quorum. We were called to order already. I don't think we have a quorum. Okay. Eva Henry? Here. Jeff Baker? Bill Holland? Here. Thank you. <laughs> Elise Jones? <laughs> Deb Gardner? David Beacom? Here. Randy Wheelock? Sean Wood? Chrissy Panganello? Anthony Graves? Robin Knage? Kevin Flynn? Here. Roger Partridge? Here. Gail Watson? Libby Zabo? Casey Ty? Bob Pfeiffer? John Marriott? Bob Roth? Here. Larry Vidham? David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Matt, uh, Ann Justin, Lynn Baca, Rex Bell, Tara Radloff, George Teal, Jason Bauer, Doris Trular, Carrie Penaloza, Laura Christman, Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Steve Yates, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, President, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glore, Sersha Karras Graves, Casey Brown, Ron Rakowski, TJ Gordon, Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Stephanie Walton, <clears throat> Shakti, Dana Gutwein, Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Phil Sunanik. Present. Wynn Shaw. Here. John Peck. Gabe Santos. Ashley Stolzman. Bob Muckle. Connie Sullivan. Dan Greenberg. Colleen Whitlow. Here. Deborah Jerome. Sean Foray. Chris Larson. Kyle Mullica. Jordan Sowers. John Dyack. Here. Sally Daigle. Gary Howard. Rita Dozal. Mark Blasis. Heidi Williams. Eric Montoya. Herb Atchison, Emma Pinter, Joyce J, Bill Van Meter, <laughs> Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith. All right. So the first item is a summary of the May 3rd board work session. Uh, the minutes are under attachment A. If there are no comments or changes to those minutes, they'll be accepted as is. See no comments. We have one person who's here for the first time, I believe, Tara Redloff from Castle Pines, new member in uh, her first visit here. So welcome. All right, agenda. Oh uh, well, let me let me mention real quick. You might notice that I'm not Herb Atchison. I'm much better looking. Um, Herb is not here, and he normally chairs this meeting, but in his absence, I'm chairing it. Um, so the next item, agenda item four, is public comment. Uh, the chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board of directors. Is there anybody in the public that would like to address the board today? Seeing nobody, we will move on to agenda item uh, five, which is under attachment B, discussion of, uh, discussion of return on investment evaluation, and that is Doug Rex. Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And I'm going to turn this over to Dan Jarrett here in a second, but I wanted to introduce this item. This is really an initiation um, or initial discussion that we'll have on this topic. Um, you will recall in, I believe, both white papers that the TIP policy work group or the TIP review work group at the time uh, produced talked about the necessity, the critical need to uh, be able to quantify the, the benefits of projects that we ultimately fund. Um, the price, so it will allow us or give us greater confidence that the projects that we ultimately fund are, are, um, are the projects that provide the best or the most benefits. So um, we wanted to kick off this initial discussion with you this, today and get your opinion on the direction or a proposal that staff has in, in, um, in, in possibly um, you know, methodology and how to do this. So without further, for further ado, I'll turn the mic over to uh, Dan Jarrett, our chief economist. Dan. Thank you, Doug. Um, welcome. Um, I'm uh, happy to be here and, and talk to you tonight. Um, I guess to, to add on to, to Doug's introduction, so for the last two to three months, we've been kind of tackling this issue or asking this question. Going forward, how, how would we or how could we evaluate projects um, 
maybe in a different light, adding a little bit more, I don't want to say rigor yet to kind of set up the presentation, but, but we've had a few conversations with the TIP working group um, and, and, and had some brainstorming sessions and, and many here internally. And what I want to do today is kind of give you kind of a high level summary of, of what we've been doing. And, and hopefully this sparks um, some interesting conversation today. So when you think about return on investment and transportation projects, it's a little bit different than just thinking about a traditional return on investment from a financial standpoint. We, we know if there's, a, if there's a project that we're, a bank funds, there are clearly identified costs, there are clearly identified projected benefits, in term, usually in some aspect it's, it's, it's a return, and therefore we can get to a calculated metric, which is a return on investment, um, fairly easily. It gets a little bit it gets a little bit um, harder when we're thinking about transportation projects, and that's because, you know, uh, building a new road, a new bridge, um, a bike ped path, these things come with very direct benefits that we can calculate. There are, there are, there are ways we can look at, say, uh, you know, adding, adding a road and suggesting that, okay, this is going to have an impact on congestion and I can calculate the difference, of, you know, how, how it's impacted before and after with congestion. But get to something like a, like a bike, a bike path or, or a pedestrian path and, and the benefits start to get a little bit harder to define. Um, so our approach and what we've done for the last couple months is to dig into what other people have done around the country, other MPOs, departments of transportation, other nonprofit groups, and, and kind of sorted through it and tried to pick maybe you know the best of what we saw um, and maybe some of the more robust techniques that we saw. Um, and one of the one of the things that kind of kept floating up to the top was when you're thinking about a transportation project, there were these dimensions that were that were um, suggested, and this was kind of throughout our survey of of how different groups ha have tried to evaluate transportation projects from an ROI perspective. And these are this is not an exhaustive list, but I, but I think it hits on some of the some of the major components of of how we would think about the benefits of a transportation project, and you can see them up there on the screen. So of course there are economic benefits that will come from a transportation project. Um, there are social benefits. So different projects are going to fall on different groups of people differently, and those are things we would want to think about from a cost benefit perspective. Um, there are obviously are environmental impacts, right? And I think we spend a lot of time here um, at Dr. Cog thinking about that. Um, there are health benefits, right? So, so you know, increasing the activity of our pedestrians and, and of our of our general public, right, comes with benefit. And then there there's overall livability, and you know, this is this is a little bit more difficult to define, but you know, this is you know, are we are we working towards improving the quality of life here in the region? So these are the different dimensions that, that we are looking at. And like I said, this is not an, it's not an exhaustive list, but it, it, it's, I think it encapsulates the way that we're thinking about the problem. So one of, one of our peer groups that I, we kind of decided, came, you know, developed a, a pretty interesting model was MTC in the Bay Area. And they have, they have gone through this exercise, actually, more than once. And I, I'll also say, when you're thinking about trying to develop the return on investment for a transportation project, we can be incredibly quantitative and we can keep it as financial as we possibly can um, and treat it just like a bank would be treating the ROI on an investment. But slide all the way to the other end of the spectrum and there are all these benefits that are much more qualitative in nature. So these, I would refer back to the, that dimension slide. So this is, this is, you know, is it improving public health? Um, is it improving our overall quality of life? You know, what, what social groups are these projects falling on? Um, so the way that we've been thinking about this going forward and, and what we'd like to try to test out is, is kind of a two-dimensional uh, model. And this is very stylized, um, hopefully just to kind of show you um, what, what can be done and what can, what can fall out of this type of analysis. But um, if we just look at this simple, um, this simple graph, you know, we're basically, what we're trying to do is map a project, its cost and benefits, something that we can try to quantify, against something that's a little bit more qualitative that's running down on the horizontal axis, which is, you know, for example, if we dug into MetroVision and we looked at a project, you know, is it hitting on the tenets of MetroVision? Uh, you know, however, however those would be defined, you know, the, the outcomes, the objectives, or the tip focus areas, 
you know, a, a much more qualitative way to think about a project, but I think an important way to think about evaluating a project from a return on investment standpoint. And then obviously the cost benefit, you know, that is, that is more, that is, a, you know, more modeling work. It's more quantitative in nature. We're trying to make assumptions on how to quantify something like, you know, how, what if we, re, what if we reduced congestion or, you know, ha, you know, there, there are ways to quantify things such as um, improving safety on our, on our network. So, uh, and, and also to kind of get back to the stylized example, I put two projects up there, and I put them up there for a very, very specific reason. Um, if you look at project B, which is, you know, sitting kind of higher up on the, on the vertical axis, um, if, you know, it, it is, this project is basically showing it has a very, a very high, and that's, and in this case we haven't defined what the, what the breakdowns are of cost benefits, but it has a very high cost benefit ratio in what, however we define um, that scale. Um, but it, but if you look at it against the horizontal axis and, you know, the number of Metrovision outcomes or objectives, you know, maybe it's only hitting on one of those, but it comes with a very, very high cost benefit um, return. Compare that to Project A, right? So it looks like its cost benefit ratio, um, you know, is, is definitely lower than Project B, but it looks like it might be cutting across a number of Metrovision objectives or outcomes. I put this slide up here just to, to get around that there, there is no, there's nowhere um, on this graph that we're trying to push projects or that projects are all going to fall. And I think as well as we think about this as a collection of projects at the regional level, I would, I would encourage you to think about you know, these two projects and suppose we had three or four um, placed up there to think about it almost kind of like an investment portfolio, right? In any of your personal investment portfolios, there are a number of, of different investments that you make. Some have very, very high payoffs and low risk. Some have very high payoffs and high risks, and we can, we can talk through. But to think that every project is gonna land on the exact same spot on this graph probably isn't true. Right? So I think to, to also step back and, th and remove yourself from just an individual evaluation or return on investment, but think about it collectively also. How do these projects look as a group? Right? Are, are, they moving, are they moving our outcomes, our objectives forward, and are they doing it in a way where we're seeing benefits over costs? So one of the things that we thought about a uh, with this model was if we took those five dimensions that I mentioned, right, the not, not exhaustive as a list, and we started to think, what, what, measures do, what measures would we want to evaluate that might actually help drive some of those measures? So we thought in, internally here, we just kind of scratched our heads and said, well, what do we have sitting around right now in Dr. Cog um, between our modeling teams and, you know, and our planning teams and the work that we've done um, that, you know, that could help make the example? Um, once again, I, I offer this as just an example, but not an exhaustive list. But for example, if we had a group of projects and, you know, we, we have capabilities and we have models here that can look at, you know, VMT, they can look at um, greenhouse gas emissions from, say, our base scenario and then against a scenario where we have, you know, basically tested out these different projects or, or groups of projects together. And, and so I, I threw this list up here just because it, these, these are, you know, these are measures that, we, you know, we are collecting and we are working on and modeling on, on a daily basis here at Dr. Cog. And, you know, there are many, many more um, that obviously can be added to this list that might influence one of those five dimensions. But I think this is kind of an interesting start. I want to give an example of basically how we're thinking through this. And I hope this maybe connects the dots a little bit for you. But how do we take basically some measure, you know, one of these measures on this table or one that's maybe not on this table that you might have kind of registering right now in your head, how do we actually then think about moving from a measure to an actual return on investment calculation on a project, right? There's one interesting thing that we have to think about in that one of the things we have to wrestle with when we have these different dimensions and we have benefits that are some are quantitative, some are qualitative, is that we consider those, some, a project can have a very strong direct benefit that we can all identify, but they can also have underlying indirect benefits, right? And I, I kind of want to highlight that here. So this is, this is an example. So suppose project A, right, um, in, in jurisdiction, uh, you know, unnamed, right? We look at it, we evaluate it, it looks like it reduces travel time, right, on, on the network, uh, you know, on a certain portion of the network. But what does that actually mean then from a return on investment standpoint if we were to use that five, those five dimensions? Um, 
a reduction in travel time obviously could impact our economic system um, very directly, right? So if we can reduce travel time all over the region, that means that we will have improved access to markets, right? That is a direct economic benefit that will make us more competitive both internally and externally, right? With other regions, with the, with, with the U.S. as a whole, with the global economy. We could also, if, we were, if we're reducing travel time through whatever this transportation project might be, we could also be improving access to jobs. And that, it, that goes back to that dimension of, of, of social that, I, that, that we had on that first slide, right? So if we're improving, if we're reducing travel time, then we, maybe, we have redu maybe we've re improved access to jobs for, for, for a low-income group in a certain part of the region or throughout the entire region, right? I would also say that could be a direct benefit of, of, of this measure um, of working out. But I, I want to kind of point out the way that this, is, this, this uh, diagram is set up is that there could also be indirect benefits, right? And this is something we thought through stylized. I'm, I bet we could all, I could give you this blank and you could probably all draw arrows to different things and come up with different solutions. Um, but I think this is kind of an interesting way to highlight what we're trying to do. And that, so let's go back to that economic system. So we've reduced travel time. We think it leads to improved access to markets, which we think is going to have, uh, that's a benefit to our economic system. Well the economic system might just become more productive, right? Because we can travel, we can, we can move goods and people more efficiently, right? That could also come with higher income, right? If we're a more productive region, we would assume that that could lead to improved wages and overall improved income, which then you can see I have an arrow moving from the economic system to, to this health dimension, right? So there is a correlate there between, you know, income and overall health, general health. Right? So, so we're starting to try to think through how do we parse out the direct and the indirect benefits. So what we're, what we're thinking about and what our, what our pilot approach is and what, we, what, I, what I really want to kind of get down to today um, and present to you is how we might actually go about doing this. Um, one of the ways that we can go about this and, you know, we've also thought as we've tried to put this together, we want an approach that is transparent. We want an approach that is consistent across projects. And hopefully everyone can, you know, everyone can get on board with and, and see that this is difficult work to do. Um, you know, there's never going to be perfection in trying to, trying to calculate every, trying to capture 100% of all of the benefits of transportation projects because they do cut across all of these different dimensions. But what we can do is we can estimate um, what we call the partial monetary effects. So, for example, if we look at that top blue square, you know, we have a project that has a reduction in greenhouse, that, that, that we have shown through our modeling could reduce greenhouse gas emissions. There, there is work that has been done in different regions, um, different MPOs, different DOTs, that um, a, a, they've worked alongside FHWA and other groups out there to basically help us try to monetize what that means. So a reduction in greenhouse gases by X percent can be translated into some monetary figure. Um, another one I think that's, that, that is maybe, um, I think we can all kind of hopefully get our heads around is congestion. So suppose we have a project that reduces congestion, right? We know that there is, there is a monetary value associated with being less productive by sitting in traffic, right? Or, or, or taking longer on public transit. So, you know, our goal would be to basically take a look at projects, see if we can identify measures that can then further be quantified looking and seeing if we can actually apply some, some multiplier through it, whether it's from the FHWA, whether it's from something that we've developed internally. Um, like I said, there is a lot of work on, on um, the sources of how we can try to monetize this, but then we could basically get to some additive total set of benefits uh, that we could then compare against the costs, right? The cost side is a little bit easier on some of these projects. We have a pretty good feel for what costs might look like on a lot of these projects. But it is really the difficult piece of this puzzle is really trying to quantify some of those benefits that just don't come directly to us. So we have to kind of take another step and try to identify how we might think about a bike ped, for example. Um, as we went through our, our evaluation of, of the different ways that different groups around the country and around the world, frankly, who have tried to do this in the past, we tried to come up with a list of strengths and weaknesses um, that we want to be obviously transparent and, 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 and communicate to you. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the strengths that we think with this approach is that it is transparent, 
Um, it's consistent across projects. Um, we can actually test sensitivities as well. So it allows us to basically run different scenarios and, and test different levels, I guess you could say, of benefits. Um, we know that with any of this work, whether we're using an incredibly quantitative model um, or something a little bit more assumption driven like this approach, that we have to worry about that indirect effect. Right? So we know that you know, it's what we would call the double counting. Right? So if we, if we have a project that increases, uh, well, let's say has a direct impact on the, envir you know, on the environmental dimension that we've been thinking about, well, we know that probably is going to have an indirect impact on somebody's health outcome as well. So you know, the, the, we, we know that we have to be very, very careful on how we would want to count those. Um, and it's obviously a lot of the work that would go into this are, are the assumptions, right? And, and that's, that's what my, my group has been doing alongside other teams here at Dr. Cog is really trying to drill down and see, you know, for other groups who have gone through this type of ROI analysis with their project selection, you know, where, where did they think the strengths lie? Where, um, you know, we, you know we're, we're in the process of, of, of talking with a few other MPOs to ask basically wh what were the weaknesses? Where did people, where did people really struggle with this? So, we, so that we can come back and basically give you a very, very rounded um, approach that you know, we think you know, is, is, a, is a jumping off point. So that's, I guess that's all I have for, for formal presentation. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions around this um, and you know like I said w what we're hoping to do is, is test this pilot approach actually maybe go back and take a look at some of the projects that we have on the books um, you know th that are maybe from past cycles and just see how this how this works and see if we can start to see some consistency across the approach so that that's that's where we're hoping to move so, so this is a staff presentation with no formal motion required but we will take uh, questions director Cernanic then Brockett uh, thank you, Jared. Uh, it um, strikes me, uh, now hearing your presentation, having just seen the slides before, um, a little more complicated than I would like um, to, to think of something like this, um, in that um, one of the things we're dealing with is transportation dollars. And um, even though we have a Metro Vision plan that deals more broadly with that, um, would like to focus on or at least see a focus in, a, in one of your charts you're actually more focused on transportation items and to be in a position to say what are we really trying to, to do with our, with our system-wide principles and rather than necessarily starting with the Metro Vision Plan in its, in its entirety, um, might want to start from a, a base of um, what are the transportation system-wide principles that we want to have? And then from there, uh, some of the measures that would say, how do we achieve those objectives? Uh, for example, uh, I could take one very simple one, which is predictable travel time uh, across the system. Uh, another might be safety across the system. And speak of those because they're, they're there, as opposed to the all five elements that you have, which do emanate or at least have components within the Metro Vision Plan in its total totality, but aren't necessarily as, and they may be indirectly impacted by transportation, but aren't as close to those system-wide principles. And um, I would have a hard time uh, buying into that first bullet point that this is simple uh, in the context of trying to explain it to a constituent or even other members of my council to say, here's the measures we're using for uh, what we're looking at in this particular tip cycle and those objectives that we're looking to, to measure and obtain uh, with our allocation methodology that we're going to be going through. Uh, so that's my, those are, that's, my, that's my thoughts around this. It seems a little more complicated. I'd rather start with system principles. What are those things that we want to measure when we're taking a look at transportation dollars. Director Brockett. Thanks for that presentation. I a question, uh, it was a little unclear to me. You, did you say that you would be looking at the case studies of other areas that have done this and bring back a report to us on that? Did I understand that correctly or no? We already. No. Yeah. Okay, sounds like I'm <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I think what we're proposing is um, actually working 
through some projects that we've funded in years past, and we won't we won't name those projects, and just see what it looks like, you know, through this filter. Um, but they've done some research from from other communities. If that's of interest to the board, we'd be happy to share that. Yeah, it would be, I think, yeah. to me at least, uh, that it sounds like other communities and other areas have implemented these, and it would be really interesting to know some of the details of how they implemented it, if they feel like some have been successful or not.